Hey everybody, it's me. I'm totally back and ready for this. I feel as though I owed you a video because it's been quite a few days since I've been on last. I first want to start off by thanking each and every one of you. I took a few moments the other night and sat on my sofa and really thought about why this makes me so happy. And I guess I would say that um, I never expected to have over 3,000 people already subscribed to me within just a few short months. Sometimes it takes a person or a channel, you know, 15, 17, who knows how many years to construct what I've been able to do with you and your help within just a few months. So I am so happy and so thrilled that I've been able to get this done and it's only because of all of you. That's the only reason why this has become so successful for me, so thank you. Um, so this is kind of a celebration video of getting over 3,000 subscribers. What an amazing, amazing feeling. So please, as always, continue to like the videos. Please get your friends to subscribe. Send this out to anyone that you feel would enjoy it as well, because that's the way the channel has continued to grow. So thank you so much. I'm going to go over to the light box in just a few seconds here, or a few minutes. You know how I am. I like to share with you first. Um, I had a, an amazing, amazing experience this last Sunday with Thelma. Thelma interviewed me on Sunday, and it was amazing for me because I never expected so much attention on my art. I expected attention on, you know, me as a collector, or me as an antique dealer, or me as an auction advisor, and Thelma took a path that um, caught me off guard, but in the most refreshing and amazing way. So please go over and show your support for Thelma, because she gave me a platform to talk about my art and experience things that I hadn't experienced for quite some time because I'm so hectic with my life and moving and my job at the auction, you know, facility to, to get these catalogs done um, and to be, you know, highly productive. So Thelma, thank you so much for making me slow down and enjoy this. Um, your advice was amazing and I heard every word of it. So um, if you haven't seen the video, I did post it on my community tab. So if you just tab over at the top of this you know, video feed, you'll see my community tab. And it's the first video down. There's a link to it. So click on that and please watch it because like I said, I, I'm so happy that it happened. Um, and Thelma, thank you again and again and again. Um, and please go over to her channel because if you don't know about her, you should. <laughs> she is a, an amazing, amazing human um, with a, a lot of kindness, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of style. She's a heck of a great lady. So thank you, Thelma. Um, I do have other channels that I'm going to refer to in my next video. I made a small list of the ones that I watch, and a lot of you responded to my last video because you were so happy that I shared those channels with you of people that I watch and I enjoy. So I'll get to that in another one. A book that's still out on my desk right after the interview with Thelma. I ran to my bookcase and I was hopeful that this book was still there. All the old bookmarks in it that have been there, um, unfortunately, because of how frequently I read this, the dust jacket wore off and I threw it away. Um, it's Letters to a Young Poet. And this book was such an inspiration to me. And in my interview with Thelma, I had said it was given to me in 91, 92. There's the inscription from Rhea. Um, the woman who gave it to me when I was working at a veterinary clinic. And as I look through this, um, I did, you know, throughout time, underline certain, um, certain sections that really resonated with me at different times in my artistic life. And it's not only for artists or poets, um, it's for everybody. And it kind of gives you an insight as to how life can be, you know, um, through your struggles and through your obstacles, um, how you can conquer those things and still come out with a smile. And it kind of resolves your spirit in a way and allows you to move forward. So that book has always been an inspiration. 
on to the things that are still out on my desk. In the video, I talked about these lamps, these peacock lamps. They're Czechoslovakian, and they're all glass beaded. They're from right at, at the, uh, uh, the, the first quarter of the 20th century. So there's that one as I peek around it because there's no, no room on this table again. Uh, the bases are marble, and it is a matched pair. So they do face each other. Let's see if I can get them both in there for you. They do face each other. And when they're lit up, they are just absolutely beautiful. Uh, the light behind them is um, so warm and so beautiful. And the glass beads are all there. And um, just just really, um, really, really, really remarkable craft. Um, and that to have a matched pair is just exceptional. So I wanted to show those very quickly for those of you ha who hadn't seen the interview. Um, I, I talk about those briefly in the interview. One thing that came to me this week, because after all, this is a Jason fancy show and tell. Um, and a lot of the comments have been so positive about the fact that I don't just show jewelry. I show other things that I find in my travels. And this teapot came to me. And actually, the size of it, it is technically a coffee pot. At least that's based on um, the the contents or the size of the vessel on the inside. Uh, and that can be debated whether it's a teapot or a coffee pot. Um, I'm just going to call it a, a vessel. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it at this point. So there's no fighting on my channel. The hallmarks are on the bottom. And the seller thought that it was silver plate. And it, it's not. It's solid sterling silver. And it dates to, I believe the date letter, I, again, this just came in. I believe the date letter is 18... Uh, 38 or 1848 and beautifully hand chased and repoussé all these parts so lovingly hand constructed and yes it you know it's dusty and it's dirty because it just came in and I hadn't had time to clean it but look at the remarkable work and I believe that would be a family crest on the front of it that's been completely hand engraved but the chasing and repoussé work the grace and the elegance the, the even the feet, the attention to the detail on the feet and the insulator handle with these natural elements that then insulate the heat from, you know, going into the handle so you wouldn't burn your hand on the inside of the vessel. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Everything is just so well crafted on this and the lid fits so perfectly. And then that flower finial that's still there, uh, just a remarkable survivor. And um, I was so elated to find that. So my, my point is that's a testament to please do your research on hallmarks. Please do your research on looking at the way something is constructed. At first glance, that looks silver plate. Uh, and the price difference is, is drastic. A silver plate that would be maybe on a, a great day, maybe it's 50 to $75 on, on, on a really great day. You know, as sterling silver and of that age, it's at least you know, 800 to 1,000 and possibly more. Maybe it's 1,200 to 1,400. So with additional research, I'll be able to narrow that one down. But I had to share that since it's out on my desk and a new arrival and had me crazy and excited. Um, this is the Noble Effort Marble. It was made by Noble Effort. And I believe the gentleman, um, I believe the gentleman that constructed this was Roe Purser, P-U-R-S-E-R. -E and I sure hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's R-O and then Purser, P-U-R-S-E-R. -E and if you look it up online, the skill that it took to put this together was insane. Uh, this artist was clearly a master at not only caning patchwork technique, but encasing this whole thing in clear glass. And it is signed, I'll take it over to the light box. It is signed Noble Effort. And I believe it's dated 1980 or 1984. The, the last numeral looks like a zero now that I look at, at it more. Um, so just a remarkable thing. And it comes with its original Noble Effort ba uh, base. So it's got the base right there that then this sits on. And of course, this was never meant to be a toy. It was always meant to be a glass sculpture. So just something that was meant to be a testament to the skill of the craftsperson and this glass artist who is very revered. Um, that cost me $150 at an estate sale. 
I think it was on the second or the third day, didn't sell on the first day. And um, I was so glad that it was still there, obviously. And if I would have seen it on the first day or really thought about it, I most certainly would have bought it based on its construction. And they go for around $3,500 to around $4,500. Uh, and there is a website online. So if you go to Noble Effort by Roe Purser, you'll see a whole list of information about the artist and the way it's constructed. So I hope I have at least the baseline information correct, but that was the initial search that I did, that I found the information on. But just touching it as an artist, I knew it was fantastic. Um, and uh, Edwardian Platinum and Diamond Ring, again, this won't do justice here, but uh, I'll take it over to the light box. We'll discuss that. The collection of the um, crystal and cut glass watch holders and also jewelry caskets. I have a huge, huge, huge collection of those. And the reason I brought these out is because I just added four more into the collection. And again, they're getting really hard to find, incredibly hard to find. And the prices are going through the roof. I, I never would have imagined it because years ago when I was collecting these at the thrift, this one's even engraved on the top and has a little powder puff on the inside that someone had stored on the inside, like an ostrich feather um, vanity puff. But the little feet and the how deep the cut crystal is on these is remarkable. Just the craft and the skill that it took to put these together. Fantastic. So I'll take those over to the light box. I'm a sucker for any original jewelry boxes. So I found this and it's a Victorian original. So again, it would have contained likely a brooch and then a pair of earrings. So, but you know, these are again, really rare to survive time. So that was something that I went crazy for. A Juliana bracelet and earrings. And I don't normally get into costume right now, but when I see this kind of color and I see this kind of craft, I am all in, you know, and if the price is right and I know that I can make some money, I most certainly will do it, you know, so I want to um, be able to help you with that when they're not signed to kind of identify things that aren't signed. A diamond ring, a silver bracelet, a very unusual Victorian brooch, and I took a chance on this, and I know that in my heart of hearts, I was right by taking a chance. Again, it's going to be very hard to see, but this is a Victorian brooch right around 1860, maybe 1865, but original pin back on the back, safety chain and stick pins so the wearer didn't lose the brooch, and that face is remarkable. It was sold as Santa Claus. However, through a little bit more research, I'm convinced that it's not. I'm convinced that it is uh, the man who represents nighttime, also sleep. He's got a little cap on, no beard. So I think we're not into just exactly a Santa Claus there. I think we're into something a little bit more. Um, a modernist brooch, a heady Carnegie poured glass brooch, because so many of you asked about my costume. This incredible poured glass, real poured glass a dragonfly brooch by Mimi D.N. She was a fantastic maker right around late 1950s, early 1960s. Her stuff is getting very, very difficult to find, highly collectible, and no one really talks about it because they don't find it much, you know? So it's kind of like not one of those makers that people are discussing. And the reason for that is because you just don't find it very often. So I'll talk about that. A miniature picture frame. Uh, I still cannot figure this out, but look at that little tiny mirror. I mean, the mirror in there is a tiny little piece of broken mirror, and this has been around a long time. So the person that produced this, why on earth would you make a mirror this small? Um, I have my, uh, I have my feelings on that. But that is incredible as a miniature. So that made me very happy. I'll take that over to the light box. A large amethyst brooch. I'll take this over to the light box. I'm getting distracted as usual. And one thing that was still out that I want to do a future video on because everybody talks about this and rightfully so. If I didn't own it, I most certainly would want to own it. Um, back in the day, I was reading the Bakelite books, the big book of Bakelite, which is by Matthew Burkholz or Matthew Burkholz. And it's, in, an incredible book and it features kind of the centerfold or the main portion of the book is Sally Loeb and Hurley, Herbie Loeb, husband and wife team that collected Bakelite from Chicago. I went to see them at their house in Highland Park and I wanted 
the veggie necklace. That's what I most wanted. I went there, went the whole way there. I spent the whole day with Sally and Herbie, spent the night, woke up the next morning, and I didn't buy the necklace, but I bought a whole bunch of other Bakelite from her collection, which was very expensive back in the day. And then I finally decided I had to have the veggie necklace. So here it is. I wore it to the interview with Thelma. Look at the size of this and how incredible. And when people question me as to why should people collect Bakelite, I kind of uh, steer towards these pieces. And I kind of steer towards things like this. The veggie brooch I acquired later. The carrot brooch I acquired about three years later. But but as an ensemble, it was fantastic. And these veggies are so oversized. Normally, they would be much, much smaller. And I think that's why this oversized version was so um, fascinating to most collectors. There is only one known so far. So if there's another one out there, uh, eventually I'll probably find out about it. <laughs> but uh, as of right now, this is the only one in the world. And such a, a testament to uh, Bakelite and the way Bakelite was created and the whimsy of the artists that got a hold of that material. So again, thank you so much to each and every one of you. I so have to say it again and again and again. And please let this be a celebratory video. Not going to drone on too much longer. I've got tons of stuff to do today. So uh, again, for the last few days, I wasn't feeling, you know, 100%. There were, you know, some uncertain things. Everything's fine. You know, don't worry about me. But it was just not the right timing for a video. So just know when I feel like I can and I feel like I should, I'm definitely going to come to all of you as my new friends to say, here I am and this is what I'm going to share today. All right. So thank you so much. Again, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. I read each and every single one of them. If I don't have a lot of time, I'll just click the thumbs up and heart. I'll get back to you later. And you all know that I will do that. The videos that I've promised are coming very, very soon, likely starting on this next Tuesday. And I am going to go live again this next week at some point. I don't know exactly what day. My work schedule at the gallery and out in the field is insane. So please just bear with me. And again, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. Wait one second. I'm going to try and pause this this time and not lose you. Wait one sec, okay? All right. Be right back. Okay, everybody, look how successful I'm getting at this. <laughs> so here is the Noble Effort marble that I just referred to a few moments ago. Look at the caning on this and the way that the, quote, Millie Fiore is constructed. So inside of each individual cane are images of all sorts of animals, camels, dogs, chickens, rabbits, birds, a penguin, a shark, a rabbit, another form of a rabbit, a butterfly, a bird in flight, you name it, this person created such a work in glass art. And look at the size of this marble. It is gigantic. I believe that this one is three and an eighth inch across. And again, I could go grab my measuring tape, but really no reason to when you look at something like this and see how it's constructed. So all of those canes are in fact kind of hollow on the inside and then blown with a double terminal. So a pontal was down here and it was ground off and polished. Okay, so that's where it connected to the cane. Um, I have marveled at this for a very long time, and you can see why these go for thousands and thousands of dollars. So I'll let that sit there just for a second, then you can take that all in. I will find the signature in just one moment because it's very difficult to locate, and I don't want to make you dizzy. All right, so you took that all in, and then if we just go right, yep, there it is. If we go right there, and I bring it up to you, should be able to get in there pretty close for you right there. Again, the zero looks like a four, but it's 1980 and it's noble effort. So if you ever see that signature in a marble, please 
pay attention. Unfortunately, I have fingerprints all over this right now, but if it wasn't, you know, marred up with my fingerprints, you would see such a high luster and a high polish. Again, museum grade glass and an investment for the future. So please look up Noble Effort Marbles. Now, my collection of marbles and vintage marbles and antique marbles is massive. So I'll bring out more of those eventually. You know, I never discuss or talk about eBay sales, but I had two very strong eBay sales this week, and I wanted to share them before they get shipped out. This is a very rare Coro, C-O-R-O, -O, enamel brooch of either a sea serpent or a mythological beast or a dragon. And it's cold painted enamel on pot metal, and it is signed right there with the Coro mark, C O. R-O, a very early and very unusual version of this brooch. The enameling is in absolutely remarkable condition. And the, the way that this is hand painted, the tonality, the fact that it's the original pin stem, no solder seams, no repairs, but just an exceptional version. Not one I was able to find in a book. So I guess that the value, I bought it for very little. I never comment really on how much I spend for a lot of reasons. But this I paid very, 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 very small amount for. Um, and it sold on eBay for $950. So a really magnificent brooch and a great profit margin. So that's going to go out in the mail later on today. And another one, which is by H-A-R. And you can call it Har, but I, I, I usually say H-A-R, is the Chinaman brooch. And it also has the matching earrings. And what a whimsical and fun set this is. And the earrings match the um, brooch, and they do face each other. Again, thermoplastic for the faces. So just, you know, a, a plastic that is faux ivory. And then faux jade, which is glass. And then Aurora Borealis rhinestone accents with this beautifully kind of antiqued white painted surface. The earrings are signed right there, H-A-R. Um, and this one, yeah, is unsigned, which is normal. So there's the H-A-R. And then here is the brooch. And look, he's the full figural version. Sometimes you'll find just kind of the bust area up on these. But this is the full figural. So he's a little bit harder to find. And I believe that this set, I think I sold it for $350 or $375. And um, well worth the money because very difficult to find. Um, Har has also, you know, done um, tree, like uh, um, the... Uh, ch a cherry tree blossom. Sorry, I'm stumbling over that, but like the cherry tree. I think they did a wisteria. Then they did some just um, like a dogwood, I think, too. But they were really well known for this. And also the dragon line. So they did the dragon. That's the one I was trying to come up with. <laughs> the dragon line is, is really well respected as well. So let's focus on that. So there is the... Oops, he was upside down. So there is the horror set that's going out in the mail. But I just wanted to say eBay has been really fantastic for me lately. So that has been uh, magnificent. Just wanted to show that before that goes out in the mail. And then the diamond ring that I had in the video, this this I could do a whole separate video on because I love it so much. The scintillation in this diamond and the effervescence of that stone, that center stone, magnificent. So it's a very white diamond. Haven't had it graded yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it comes back in the near colorless range. But the fire, the scintillation, the center stone is just under a full carat. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit without bumping the photo booth. I've been very clumsy lately these days. Look at the scintillation in that center stone. It is just a dazzler. And then the stones on the outside really help frame it in a beautiful platinum mounting Again, kind of cut down. They're very flush set. Look how wearable that is. 
that central bezel holding the central stone just really magnificent but i had to bring that out and i had to show you not sure that it's signed platinum let me take a quick look there's one hallmark there that might be let's take a look with my other eyes <laughs> with my real eyes it's um 18 karat and platinum so i think the shank system is 18 karat and then the top of this portion is then platinum so basically platinum topped gold is what we've got here so really really beautiful stone and an, a, a magnificent end result for a diamond ring so there's that and i'm um, nestled in a magnificent old box and of course i've got dust and dirt all over it <laughs> what else is new right um and then these jewelry boxes that i had mentioned i'll just kind of have a little parade of them i wish let me back out a little bit so this is the one that's in the worst condition of all of them but look at how deeply cut the crystal is the little brass feet the way that this is all treated here and this has the little hook up here to hold the pocket watch so essentially this would continue Contain an open face pocket watch and then this could be moved throughout the Victorian home to house the watch and keep it safe and make sure that it's running and keeping time so basically you would turn your watch into a clock in a way with these and some of them are specifically for jewelry um, this one I had said that there was a powder puff left inside and it's true there's the little uh, powder puff again these all come with like a satin little pillow on the inside that then would hold jewelry um, and this one was for sure either ring or something very small in this one. Um, and again, depending on size, I think that's what dictated what they would use them for. They're usually zinc tin bottomed. And I don't think I've ever seen one except zinc tin bottom or like a cardboard or pressed paper bottom. But look at the work in the brass as well. I've always found these to be so beautiful. And then just a few more. Um, here's another one. And again, same similar design, but slightly different. You know, look at the little pillow on the inside. This one is red velvet and uh, just really great craft on these. And again, it was something that there's the paper bottom on one there. It's just something that I've loved, you know, I, I can't help myself, but I guess when it comes to being a jewelry collector, you're of course going to collect everything that involves jewelry. <laughs> at least I think that's the way a collector should be. Look at the way that these are actually formed. So these are actually cut and polished and faceted like large gemstones that then are, you know, flat backed and then set into these brass mountings. But this style of box, again, years ago, I was able to get them for maybe, oh, you know, 20 to $30. I think the last one I bought was 175 So the prices of these have really gone up quite drastically and over the last just few years. Um, so getting harder and harder to find. And here's kind of the grand finale. Boy, are these things dusty. <laughs> uh, and so there's the big one. Look at the inside of this one. So the front opens up. And then again, you hang your pocket watch right here. So then you would turn your pocket watch into a functioning clock. And look, you have a little handle that you could carry it around the house with you you know how convenient you know and now we just use our cell phones you know to see what time it is and that's pretty sad you know that we've gotten so far away from things like this but why isn't someone making such a beautiful container to hold someone's cell phone you know right zinc tin back um, uh, and a uh, uh, painted bottom on this one, but all metal construction behind. But again, I had to bring this on because it's a testament to a gone by era that I think is so beautiful and we shouldn't forget. You know, we shouldn't forget these things because the more we forget, I think the less that we'll need craftspeople for. And that's for me alarming. Uh, this is the little picture frame that I brought with the little tiny mirror. Again, look how oversized this frame is compared to that little teeny tiny mirror that's been inset from the back. Again, I have a little bit of a suspicion as to what we've got going on here for both maker origin, but I'm not going to get into that just yet. But I loved, loved, loved this. You know, at first I was like, what is that? And then as soon as I touched it, I'm like, that has got to come home with me. And yes, I hung it on my wall as soon as I got home, uh, but I took it back down so I could show you guys just a remarkable miniature, you know, loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I guess there's a storyline there. You know, do we really need mirrors? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here is the running rabbit brooch. It was in one of my shorts. I wore this last week, one of my short feeds, and it's Bakelite. 
resin wash, so over dye. Pin stem is in the right direction. Again, memorize the way that that pin stem goes into the back. That's authentic Bakelite brooch. Some of the fakes are getting really good, really, really good. But look at the age of the celluloid eye and the age of the painted surface. People can fake that, but this has been around since 1940, no doubt about it. And we've got a rabbit that was late for school, which was basically, should have been my mascot as a child. <laughs> so I've got the book of ABCs. Um, in his little arm as he's running to school. Love the motion in that one. And then here is a Lucite cat brooch. I never let Lucite out of my sight either. And this one's the googly-eyed cat. So the eyes, of course, dance around as you wear it. Look at that front view expression with his wonderful bow tie. You know, such the classy fellow. And these are always reverse painted. So the painted surface is from behind, and the carving is from behind. And again, look at the riveted pin stem. There's oxidation, there's rust, there's honesty there. So you know that this one is also circa 1940. Um, and really, well, maybe into the 1950s. Uh, after all, technically, some people say Lucite didn't start until 1950 by the DuPont company, but it was definitely um, in use slightly before that, you know? So we can fight over ages and dates eventually. But again, like I said, jewelry is not a fight. It's just supposed to be fun, right? <laughs> so we have that. Um, the Juliana bro uh, bracelet and earrings. Sorry, I'm reaching for things because everything seems to be so far away from me when I get into this light box. Um, we've got the earrings and we've got these incredible, incredible, what I considered headlight stones, you know, and back in the day, dealers and collectors were calling them headlight stones. Now they're called Rivoli. So uh, again, no fighting over terms because we're still allowed to call them either. <laughs> Everyone needs to settle down uh, and not attack people over terms. There's no reason to. So um, these are almost like a, um, a moonstone glass in a way. And I would normally consider them like silk glass if they were matte finished. But these are, they're just beautiful. And look at these fancy shaped, you know, almost heliotropic, just really, really beautiful beautifully done. And of course, Telltale Sign of Juliana, um, which was produced by D&E, um, and D&E produced for many companies. Um, we have this, you know, classic link chain. There's no denying that, that that's Juliana. There's, there's, there's no denying it. So absolutely a beautiful set and moderately priced. I think I got that one for $45 for the set. I couldn't have gotten the money out fast enough. Um, and then this one, I brought this, you know, I, I did one similar in one of my short feeds and, and this is a totally different brooch. This is, I believe this one was Hattie Carnegie. Let me make sure that I'm correct. Yep. Um, let me make sure on that. Give me one second. I want to make sure that I'm telling you right. Okay, got my loop out. We're Hattie Carnegie, like I said. So you have poured glass. And this is, in fact, poured glass. Some sellers will say poured glass, and it has nothing to do with pouring glass. This one, in fact, is. So what you have, technically, is these metal mountings that are made. Okay, talking about the green and the red areas. And then glass is poured in from the obverse side. It's poured in from behind or sometimes is poured in from the front. So then you have a backing on the back that then is removed, and look, it creates a stained glass effect. Now, some people call this flawed emerald glass. This is really close to that, but this, in fact, is not going for flawed emerald glass, but it is trying to be a synthetic of ruby and emerald, if that makes sense. So technically, flawed emerald glass really looks like emerald you know, looks much more so like emerald than this does. And then these little tiny rhinestones are prong set. So a, a beautiful brooch. And again, a few years ago, we could have bought this for maybe 65 to $75. And now because of its size and condition, these are going for several hundred dollars. 300, 400, 500 is not unheard of these days. Um, and a, a, a just a beautiful, beautiful technique to make just a piece of costume jewelry. You know, so I wanted to show that one. I did buy another um, insect brooch just because I thought it was cool. Sterling silver, faux stones, so just glass. But I loved its gesture and I love the age on this one. So being earlier, 
mm, let's say late 40s, uh, it was a have to have because it was so large and very dimensional, very well done for a spider. And I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So that was a yes. And then um, for, let's see. Oh, I said I would bring the amethyst pendant. I, this whole box is full of stuff. But I loved this. I loved the light character of the stone. I loved the size of it. And I really did appreciate the faceting on the stone. Not the best amethyst you'll ever see, but the artist that got a hold of it made this incredible sterling silver mounting, handmade, so out of round, and signed it at the top. Well, let's see if we can zoom in on that. There we go go. Yep, we got it. And then, um, you know, do research on uh, the manufacturer of that. But that was only $12. And uh, for the piece itself, I would put it out, not knowing the artist, I would put it out around 95 and uh, definitely, hopefully, you know, find someone who would love it. Um, a synthetic uh, CZ ring that looked awfully like a diamond. I mean, these CZs are getting so good. Uh, and why buy a diamond when you can get something that looks like this for, I think I paid $18 for this, but look at the way the mounting is handled. You know, um, just a remarkable testament to the craft of this craftsperson that made this mounting. Yes, of course, cast and, fa you know, then fabricated, but the underneath carriage is beautiful. It's rhodium plated. Boy, it sure looks really, really good, doesn't it? So um, you could save yourself a whole bunch of money and just go with something like that as well, you know, but I loved the design of that one. I think the design is what motivated me. As an artist, of course, I had to have this one. Two pieces of dichroic glass just on a sterling silver coil very well done. Very, very thoughtful bezel. Look at the way the stones fit in there so carefully, you know? And I don't know, there was just something about this one, the balance and the symmetry and the asymmetry, it was a yes. That that was a yes. And I think that was nominal as well. Oh, and I wanted to thank Roberta at Jewelry Nurse. She sent me uh, moisturizing gloves and they're starting to work. My hands are becoming so beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> a sterling silver cuff. Um, origin on this, I'm going to struggle for a little while because it's borrowing elements from two different areas. Signed sterling right there. And I'm not going to comment on tribe or I'm not going to comment on origin just yet. Um, we'll get into that in a future video. But I had to have it. it, it it's hollow formed. It's out of flat sheet, then hammered and designed, but th it's just a genius piece. You know, it's not that old. Um, it it's looking, you know, to, it's, it's looking over its shoulder at older designs, but it's most certainly not old. So made within the last, I would say, 20 years, but still just one of those things that for craft, and design had me happy. Um, a Chinese bracelet. I really loved it. Very well done. Beautiful natural turquoise. And look at the way the turquoise has aged over time. So when you look at turquoise that's older, please let it be what it is. Let it go more green. Let it go more blue. Let it be lighter. Let it be darker. Let it be more saturated. Let it do, let it, let it do its thing. Um, and the way this is constructed, really beautiful silver work as well. So I had to have that because that was very moderately priced and, and in really good condition. So that was a yes and sizable, you know, sizable and wrist size. Let's see. Oh, the Mimi Dian brooch. Uh, Mimi Dian. I'll get into her as a designer, but can you imagine the surviving? Um, we have poured glass again. So handmade and formed glass, I should say, rather than poured. And then there is the signature. Let me see if I can get, there we go. I can get in on it. Yeah, sure. There we go. Mimi DN, right there. I will discuss Mimi's work. Uh, again, not something you're going to find very often, but boy, look at the end result. You know, that is very important. It screams, I'm important, you know, and I'm a rare survivor. <laughs> so really magnificent on that one. And let's see if I have anything else. Oh, yeah, I have um, three more to go. And then you're off the hook. And look at me go. I'm going to be within hopefully 45 minutes. <laughs> so this is a diamond ring. Um, this has been with me for a long time, but it was in one of my shorts. And this is 18 karat gold. And I may have brought it in uh, a past video. I don't think I did. But 
But look at the diamonds in this. Look how long the baguettes are. Almost three times the size of a normal baguette and then completely hand constructed. This artist and this fine jeweler took wires, soldered them together. Nothing in this is cast. Nothing is put into wax. All of this is constructed out of wire. Each and every single mounting and single prong is hand constructed. Talk about a master and talk about a labor of love when it comes to creating fine jewelry. This person was an absolute master. And these diamonds sing. They absolutely sing. From the appraisal that I had done, I think it's just at five carats of diamonds, I think, but a sizable, sizable presence on the finger. But look how si skyscraper, look how machine age, and then so sneaky, put one round over amongst all of the baguettes, you know? So it all often reminded me that this is kind of the Jason ring. That's Jason right there. <laughs> That's Jason right there. Doesn't fit in, but most certainly fits in. <laughs> so anyways, and thanks to all of you, thanks to each and every 3,000 people, you know, that's me proud, you know, and there I am amongst all of you beautiful, beautiful people who have supported me on this journey. And thank you, thank you, thank you. So let that be a reminder right there of how I feel. That's how I feel right there. <laughs> so thank you. Um, on to, oh, um, uh, well, okay, I'll do it anyway. So I don't get into the trembling things like the, um, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the line. I think it was maybe not hearts on fire, but it was something like that. Um, and then they uh, kind of rocked in place. This one's not going to do it because it wants to do it when it's, you know, down long ways. But those are blue zircon. And I thought that was fantastic. It was only uh, $10, but optically it was a beautiful thing. So I will, I will reach for contemporary from time to time. Don't misunderstand me. I'd prefer old. So then we're going to go into this brooch. I have never figured this out, but I'm still going to do my, my best. This has been on my desk for quite a while. Gem grade moonstone, clearly modernist, clearly 1950s, 1960s. So this form is completely hand form. So we have an artist, much like myself, and a silversmith that created uh, a wall, then soldered down a flat sheet on the inside that they so carefully hand hammered these three distinct and very directional lines on the inside. Okay, and then we have this arc. And then this beautifully, beautifully bezel set natural moonstone. Look at the color of that and look at the way it pushes and pulls the light. There's something so magnificent and so magical about that moonstone. It is absolutely breathtaking. So I'll let you take that in. And then I didn't think this was signed. And I looked all over and let me see if I can find it for you. And we can can't really get in much more than that. Let me try and zoom in a little bit more. No, we're, it's going to go. No, nope, I'm not going to get in there. You can see on the inside of the arc. Nope, you can't because we're out of focus. There. You can see on the inside of the arc, I'll hold still. You can see on the inside of the arc, a name. Again, I've done some research, can't figure it out, but this artist knew exactly what he or she was going for. Um, what a magnificent, eerie, mysterious end result, and bends the light, really a magnificent play between the two forms. Um, reminded me of being in elementary school when we would start a seed. And when you started a seed, you had to care for it, you had to put it in water, then moist soil, but you couldn't let it rot. And this reminded me of the magic that happened when you would go to bed at night, you'd wake up the next morning, and there would be the sprout. All of a sudden, this seed or this pot or this bean would then, you know, uh, magically overnight have its sprout ready to go, you know, and would start a root somewhere else. So this reminded me of that formative beauty when I was a child of watching something grow, watching something become alive. And I think this reminds me of that so much. Don't know if that's what the artist was going for, but again, Thelma touched on it the other day. My language as an artist may not be your language as the recipient, but there's a reason why as artists we create the things we do and we let our audience 
decide what the message is. You know, we let our audience decide what they want to see. And that's a, a beautiful thing that not much else can do in life. So this is my final piece for the day. This is the one I talked about that I just bought down in Columbus from a very lovely dealer. She was so nice. I think she was from the Cincinnati area. Um, what a, an awesome piece of glass in the center. She thought it was Santa Claus. And since there is no clear beard there, I think we can all fight over who this is. There's no reason to fight over it. I think with this nightcap on, I think with this style of hat, that's a person who's getting ready for bed. Also, why would there be stars? There are two stars. That's nighttime. And then this is almost a crescent moon in a way. Very stylized, but I see a crescent moon. So is it the man in the moon? Is it the, you know, um, is it Mr. Sandman? You know, what do we have going on here? So again, I've only owned it for around, I think it's now Four, day, four or five days. And uh, I bought it because it's just so unusual. And the face, I mean, that face, there's something there that's really, you know, it's eerie, but it's magical, you know, front view, full on, and then you've got the safety chain with the safety pin. So this was an important brooch back in the day, you know, someone did not want to lose this, it was very expensive. Uh, the stars are gold. So those are around nine karat gold. And then the rest of the brooch is gold filled. So uh, it is not gold. It's not um, a carat gold. This is all original, too. So this wasn't a marriage. This wasn't something that was assembled at a later time to be more desirable. So that concludes today's video. Thank you so much for all of your time, all of your love. And again, without you, this wouldn't be possible. So um, I would love to say it. And you know I know it. And you know I feel it. And you know it. I absolutely love you.